What happens when the dollar crashes? Make sure I get my mic on here. Okay. Yep. Back from jury duty. I was not selected. They didn't want your old buddy Josh to be selected. So here I am. Got back in uh, good times. Good times. All right. Working out. Good stuff, dude. Good stuff. All right. So I want to share with you this article because everyone's you know talking about the dollar is going to crash. And all this. That's so freaking stupid. But anyway, I want to share with you. So we're going to start in 1984. We're going to go over here. And this is from the Monthly Labor Review, uh, October 1984, right before Reagan was reelected, by the way, reelected by 49 states out of 50. And he almost won Mondale's home state of Minnesota. He only lost by 5,000 votes. So Reagan just smoked these guys. It was fantastic. Now, remember, this is the beginning of the Reagan Revolution or the, in, the, in the second part, the, the first half of the Reagan Revolution. All right. And remember, everyone and their mom is saying the massive debt was going to lead to hyperinflation. I got sneeze. Hold on a second. The debt spending that Reagan was doing to solidify our military is going to lead to massive inflation and tax hikes. All right. Now I'm just going to prove to you why that's just not true. All right. So here we go. Effects. Of, remember, we're going to talk about the effects of a strong dollar. And you can just the exact opposite would be the, what happens on a weak dollar. Effects of a strong dollar. Economic recovery apparent in first half import and export prices. Small price rises for imports continue to help domestic inflation during the first half. Hmm. But expect ex exporters encounter some difficulties as a powerful dollar drove up the prices of export goods and they drove down the prices of import goods, which is why we have these trade deficits, the current account deficits, which is a good thing. U.S. import prices rose 1% in the first half of 1984 after falling 2.5% during all of 1983. Remember, this is the era where we're getting over double-digit inflation for years on end. U.S. import prices fell 2.5% in 1983. Why? The vigorous U.S. economic recovery boosted demand for imported products. The strong dollar served to moderate those price increases. The small rise in import prices was an important factor for the continued slowdown of CPI. Interesting. The strong dollar and reduced demand for U.S. products by developing nations with heavy international debt placed downward pressure on export prices for those articles as well. So basically... These countries didn't have enough money to buy our more expensive products, so they didn't buy as many. Because it costs more to buy U.S. goods when the dollar is strong, and it costs less for us to buy foreign goods when the dollar is strong. That's how it works. For instance, I just bought this Lavalier, Lavi, whatever this is. It costs 15 bucks. I'm sure, yeah, made in China right there. You know, is that good, bad, or it doesn't matter. It is what it is, dude. I needed a new mic, one made in China. I got it, I ordered it yesterday, two days ago, and I got it today. Life is better now than it was in the 70s and 80s. It's just a fact. Dude. It's just a fact. Now, all the jabs and all that crap, no. Health-wise, maybe not. But in terms of the, the, our ability to get what we want quickly, the luxuries we have compared to what we had in the 70s and 80s, is not even debatable. It's just not. It's just not. I'm sorry. The strong dollar reduced demand for U.S. exports. All right. The dollar's appreciation against the currencies of our major trading partners has, held, has had a major impact on U.S. export and import prices. From as low in July 1980 to June 1984, the dollar-weighted uh, the dollar -weighted exchange rate rose 36%. That's weird because Reagan was spending so much money on defense and made massive deficits is what everyone is saying. How could the dollar appreciate when he was spending so much massive deficits? The dollar should have crashed. Over the same four-year period, the dollar rose by 750% against the Mexican peso, 107% against the French franc, 57% against the Deutsche Mark, 13% against the Canadian dollar. The dollar stood at record highs against the British pound. pound. This appreciation made imports less expensive while driving up the price of exports. So always remember that strong dollar means you can buy stuff from foreign countries cheap. And the foreign countries have a hard time buying stuff from you because it's more expensive for them. So let's just, I want to read you a page in my book, Relax and Retire. All right. Right here. Where was it? Page 28. Right here. We've been hearing about runaway inflation for decades, i.e. a crashing dollar. 
Here's an article from uh, New York Times in July 1983 uh, declaring the inevitability of massive tax hikes or, or runaway inflation if Reagan won re-election. Um, 1984 says this guy from uh, Nebraska, Senator James Exxon from Nebraska, Nebraska says the U.S. was so deeply in debt it was virtually unrepayable and that we face runaway inflation or the biggest tax hike in history. We were supposed to have a balanced budget. Two things faced us after the 1984 elections. The most monumental tax increases in our histoire or runaway inflation that may engulf our economy as we know it. Then we can see a Wall Street Week, and I have it a link in here, uh, Louis Rukeyser video where they had some clown from J.P. Morgan or something like that talk about that the budget deficits and the amount of debt was going to lead to huge increases in, inflate, in interest rates and huge inflation as well, with, or, and tax hikes to go. And none of that happened. None of that happened. That was in 1987. Uh, Reagan, when I said 49 states right here. David Stockman railed and still does about the government debt and the destruction it will cost. He was railing about it in the 1980s, and today he's still doing it. Peter Schiff, the whole thing. It's just, it's crazy. All right, let's keep going here. So I want to keep, again, this, let's keep reading this. Many developing countries, including several in Latin America, experience debt problems that force them to cut back on imports. For example, Mexico, our third largest trading partner, purchased only $5.7 billion of U.S. goods in the first half. You know what our three largest trading partners are right now? China, Canada, and Mexico. Mexico is still our third largest trading partner. Isn't that crazy? Uh, the increased economic activity, did I already talk about the Yeah, the increased economic activity sharply stimulated demand for a host of related consumer capital goods, many of them which have to be imports because they're cheaper. For example, expanding auto production, good for United States uh, workers, so they're building the, the autos here in the U.S., Spur demand for such imported items as steel, aluminum, rubber, and engines. Okay. While the increase in business investment boosts sales for foreign supplies of machine tools, building materials, and electrical equipment. Where does the increase in business investment come from when everyone's talking about crowding out? Government debt is going to crowd out, crowd out business investment. And yet, here we are. The increase in business investment boosts sales. So where is this crowding out that the economists have been saying for freaking decades? It didn't happen. Let's keep going down here. Oops. Ah, what happened? Oh, no. Oh, by the way, if you just wonder where I got this from, this is from the BLS publications going back history. Does it leave my highlights on there? Come on, man. This is pretty interesting. Contrary to expectations, the Iran-Iraq conflict seems to have helped depress oil prices. It appears that attacks by those two nations on oil-bearing traffic in the Persian Gulf induce other OPEC countries to improve, uh, boost their output. Shocking. In addition, plentiful oil stockpiles in the U.S., Japan, and Western Europe acted as insurance against disruption. <laughs> Just peak oil. Oh, my goodness, the whole thing is so stupid. Um, even so, the U.S. economic recovery stimulated demand for petrol products, uh, reversing a five-year decline. I thought this was pretty interesting. H home heating oil. Early in the 1984, heating oil demand and prices rose sharply as a result of unusually cold weather in the northeastern United States. Ah! climate change the average price for a gallon of home heating oil is 113 in 1984 right now it's about uh, i think i had on here i don't know where it is it's about five bucks all right and i think we had a price of gas right here the average u.s gasoline price of all types is 121 in 1984 so we take our trusty calculator and we're going to do that's 40 years all right so we go 121 is our uh, present value uh, we'll just say three bucks right now. We got 40 years as our N, zero payment. That, oops, I gotta do 1.21 plus minus. That is an increase. Oh, I gotta do this, boink one, and right there. That is an increase, hold on a second, compute I, of 2.3% a year in uh, natural gas, or gasoline. 2.3% a year. Yeah, hyperinflation. Hyperinflation. But no, no one wants to talk about it. So we got, what do we say for home heating oil? It's like a buck 13, 1.13. And now it's, what do we say, five? I'll say 550. I don't remember exactly, but that's an increase of 4% a year. I mean, we should have no increase because we have abundant supplies of this stuff, but no one listens to your buddy Josh. Well, domestic production of steel was up 28% in 1983. Import penetra penetration in the first half of uh, 84 was, 20, was up 25%. 
uh, up from 20% in the er year earlier period. A significant portion of the increase in steel imports came from third world countries. Many third world, supplier, third world suppliers can deliver steel prices well below the discounted prices offered in the U.S. During the first half, steel supplies from Japan and the European Committee continue to be limited by trade aggression, uh, agreements. Okay. To reduce the volume of imports, the U.S. steel industry has petitioned uh, the International Trade Commission for relief during the first half of the year. Anyway, I thought that was very interesting because what's going on here is, check this out. Mexico, Argentina, and Brazil, all major steel suppliers, have, have aggressively sought U.S. sales to obtain foreign exchange for servicing their international debts. And this is where we come to the issue. Like people say, oh, but the BRICS, we're gonna, everyone's going to get rid of the dollar. All right, let's take a look at some here, shall we? We're going to go over here to our heat map. And we're going to show you here the government budget. So here's the U.S., by far and away, the largest economy in the world. Nothing comes close. Nothing comes close. Here's our government budget, right? So we click on government budget. That's negative 5.8% of the country's gross do domestic product. We have a deficit equal to 5.8% of our GDP, all right? Uh, the U.S. averaged negative two points. <laughs> the U.S. has averaged a 2.54% of GDP from 1948 until 2022. I, I mean, I was born in 1970. My mom was born in 1946. The entirety of her life, we've averaged a deficit of 2.48% of GDP, which means we've been taking on debt, and yet we still have yet to have a crashing dollar. China has a deficit of negus. Look, every single country has a deficit. Every single country has debt <gasps> until we get to Saudi Arabia, and their economy is tiny. One trillion dollars. Wow. Wow, look at that. And they have a current account because they're exporting all their oil. But look at this. Current accounts. We're importing stuff more than we're exporting stuff. China is importing less than they're exporting. Euro. Japan is importing less because they have... And here's Germany. They're importing less. But here's India. Here's UK. Here's France. Oh, there's Russia. Look at that, Russia. Would you rather be us or any of these other countries? Canada. All these countries, Australia, they've got positive current accounts. But look at their economy, 1.6 trillion. Do you see how big we are relative to these other tiny economies? Australia is 1.6 trillion. South Korea, 1.6 trillion. Canada, 2 trillion. Russia, two, I mean, none of these countries matter. We are the only game in town. We got 330, 334 million purchasers in the U.S. of A, man. Yeah, with a median household income of a seventy thousand dollars U.S., I mean, look at this. Everyone has a current a government budget in the negative until we get to Saudi Arabia, Turkey, or Switzerland. Wow, and they get their their GDP isn't even a trillion bucks. They get eight point seven four million people. That's it. Who cares? I mean, look at Taiwan, Poland, Argent, Argent. I can't do it. Arth. I, I can't roll my R's. Here's Norway because they're exporting their oil. UAE exporting their oil. But look how tiny. It's $579 billion. Crazy. So that's the government budget. Uh, budget. All right. We can go to debt to GDP, 129. China's still got debt to GDP at 77%. People say, well, here's euro, 90%. 100% is a magic number. Why? Why is that the magic number? Here's Japan, debt to GDP, 263%. And yet they're still the fourth largest economy in the world. And again, our, high, our three highest trading partners are China, Mexico, and freaking uh, Canada. And Japan still got 124 million purchasers of stuff. They're not joining BRICS. I mean, come on, man. Give me a break. It's stupid. All right, so let's, I want to show you all something else here. Check this out. Here's global. Here's a... Uh, Debt to GDP. You can see Russia's debt to GDP is 19.6%. This country right here. Congo, Dominican, whatever the hell that is, 14.5%. Here's Canada, 100. So Canada's over 100%. Here's US, 120. Here's Brazil, 85. Here's uh, Peru, 31. Are you, seeing, are you seeing something here? Here's Ubakistan, 34. Here's Russia, 19. Here's that place. Here's this place, Tanzania. Here's freaking Australia. 
Are you seeing something here? The debt to GDP right there. Poland to Germany. It's almost like the debt to GDP really doesn't matter that much. It really doesn't matter that much, does it? Isn't that interesting? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Let's keep going. Now, we don't have much info on private debt, but look at private debt in the U.S. is 219% of GDP. Private debt in Canada is 270% of GDP. Sweden, 278% of GDP. Norway, 239%. Poland is 100%. So you see how private debt dwarfs public debt? As our, uh, Chile, 205% of debt to GDP. That's private debt. You see that? It's crazy. So now we just look at household debt. And again, we're not going to have a huge amount of uh, data here. But U.S., household debt is 77% of GDP. Canada is over 100%. Look at Germany, 55%. Sweden, 91 Norway, 89 Chile, I like to say it because it makes me sound like I'm Spanish. Here's uh, Korea. Here's Japan. So what happened to Japan? What happened to Japan? Let's take a look if we can click on that guy right there. Let's see if it gives us any right there. Oops, it doesn't really give us a whole lot. When it goes back to, oh, yeah, right there. Sweden went up. Japan, whoa. Japan went down. What happened to the economy when the Japan's debt to GDP, private household debt to GDP went down? It suffered, did it not? Yes, it did, sir. Yes, it did. So let's take a look at Japan when it comes to uh, not household debt. We're going to go to uh, private debt for Japan. So I'm going to show you guys, man. I'm not saying go out. I'm saying for you as an individual, you should refrain from debt. Here's their private debt, 229%. And here we go, back to 1995. Private debt fell from 280 to 224. And they're right there. Sweden went from 200 to 281. I don't know why I was comparing to Sweden. But now let's look at the Japan's uh, government debt to GDP. Because I just, I'm going to show you right here. back why does it keep going i want to go back hold on a second pause it so here's japan 261 percent and right there from 1990 look at that the government debt to gdp exploded yet their private debt did not their private debt went the other direction who is a driver of economic output for gdp it's consumers private debt do you think America is going to go the way of Japan? We're not going to be borrowing? I don't think so. I mean, I wish you as an individual who watches this should. It's just not going to happen. Let's go back here. I'm going to show you something. We're going to go back to global. And we're going to look at uh, the U.S. household debt of all instruments. And we're going to go to the United States. And you can see right here. Here's a Sweden. Here's the U.S. 81. Oh, that's Japan. U.S. right there. In 1995, 66, we're at 79 now. So now I like this right here, seeing that decline. But that the more we pay off our debt as a household, the more the government is going to take on debt. That's just a fact, just like what happened in Japan. And that's going to slow down the growth of the economy. What will that do for the dollar? I don't know. I don't, we don't know. No one knows. But it's not like the debt's going to go away. It's either going to be done by the government or it's going to be done by the household. Me, I don't want any debt because I know what happens with debt. As a private person, I cannot print my own dollars. I can't. So if, things, if a calamity comes, I owe money, I'm in a world of hurt. A government, especially a government that's producing as much as we are in the United States, our economy is by far and away the largest. Nothing comes close. Nothing comes close. In fact, I was just reading this morning yesterday about the GDP in China still not nearly as vibrant as what even they've been claiming because they're so heavy in debt. So they're so, I mean, their, their debt is so heavy. This is the issue we have to contend with. It's like you're saying, hmm, if their GDP is falling off a brick because they just lent and lent and lent against you know, empty uh, housing markets and whatnot, and they have no backup, we do because we're still productive. That's, it's just a fact. Now, we'll always be like, no, we got to watch our debt. And you have to watch your own individual debt for sure. But is anyone going to sacrifice a dollar to go to a Chinese yuan? No, man. Is anyone going to sacrifice a dollar to go to a Russian ruble? It's just not going to happen. I mean, it could in the future, for sure, but it's certainly not going to happen in our lifetimes. We're still in the number one economy. We still have 334 million purchasers are out there. 
We've seen the debt level that happened during Reagan and the economic output just, just went crazy. Is there a correlation there? I would think so. Is there a correlation as a causation? I don't know. But everyone's been saying, as I talk about in my book, for years that the dollar is going to crash. And it just hasn't happened. It hasn't. We want a strong dollar. That means we're going to have less exports. We're going to have more imports. We're going to have more of a current account deficit, uh, which is a capital account uh, surplus. A current account deficit is we're spent, we're sending more money overseas. But what do you think China does that that money they get from us? They buy our bonds. Why? Because it's the safest game in town. And right now we're paying 5%. What else are you going to buy? It's talking Lady S. These folks who live in Mexico. They can buy 12% Mexico CDs. That sounds pretty good, but still Mexico. You know what I'm saying? So is China going to put a bunch of their money in Mexico certificates? I mean, Mexico, Argentina, I don't know about Brazil. A lot of these countries have defaulted before. And you want to do that again? Yeah, it's on you, baby. You want to reach for yield? That's fine. Has the U.S. ever defaulted? No. We're the only game in town. We're the only game in town. I'm just, look, I'm not saying. We know for a fact there can be too much debt. You know, what happened in Japan, though, was there's a, a budget... Uh, a balance sheet recession, that's what I think Richard Koo called it, where government was spending, but private sector said, we're not, we're not. And because private sectors dwarf government debt, that made the economy just tank. It did. I mean, when I say tank, it was still operating, it was still doing good, but it just wasn't growing. And the same thing's probably going to happen here. Does that reduce the our value of our dollar? No, it's still a strong dollar. It's just going to be less consumption. And less consumption means less GDP growth. That's not necessarily a bad thing. But it's not the same as a dollar crashing. It's just not, man. A dollar crashing is massive inflation relative to the printing of dollar bills or high price of energy, which is what happened in the 70s. Massive inflation can happen in printing, without question. We've seen example after example, but we're not anywhere near that. It's so freaking stupid. People are like, oh my goodness, we're printing something. It's not anywhere near hyperinflation. It's just not. It's dumb. Now, what hyperinflation can be caused? A mass amount of print, I grant you, but also uh, not hyperinflation, but significant inflation, a la what we just went through in a la 2000, the 1970s, was because of freaking the oil stuff. The energy, uh, just nuts in energy. Horrible. And then we just suddenly have to find other supplies, even though everyone's talking about peak oil. Just don't listen to these freaking doomsdayers, man. The dollar's not going to crash. Not anytime soon. It's just not going to. It's just not. We don't have any more debt than anyone else. We, we actually need some debt to keep the economy going. It's just a fact. People are still going to borrow. People are still going to spend. People are still going to go to work. Now, for you as an individual, we want you out of debt. So that way, when the, if a calamity comes, a la 2008, you're not sitting there holding the wet bag. As a country as a whole, though, man, you're going to be fine. No. Love your thoughts. We'll see you guys.